All right. So let's spend a couple more minutes kind of understanding this concept of this tactical empathy or whatever, you know, term really stuck with you. And then let's talk about how to fix it. Cause I don't want you to leave. My, my point is not to leave you with, Hey, you're screwing up. Right. I want you to see that because we are, uh, the story that I always tell when I talk about trauma is this really dark place that I was in, but I had gone from, from, uh, a leader in my agency, multiple awards for bravery in the line of duty, multiple awards for most felony arrests in a post area, most award, awards for all kinds of things. Being that guy that Sarge could call, being that guy that always took care of business. I didn't care what time it was. I'd come out. I was proud of my profession. I was doing the right things. I went from that guy to the absolute worst employee you could possibly have working for you. I was constantly angry. I hated everybody. I hated the world. I hated my coworkers. I hated civilians. Uh, when people would ask me, uh, do I have good memories of law enforcement? I do. But the first one I remember is the last two years sitting in my me sitting in my cruiser in the median, pissed at everybody. I hated coworkers. I hated my supervisors. I hated people, even though I didn't want to admit it. I hated my family. Why? Cause I was pushing them away. Right. I'll just go deal. I'll just go take care of this myself. You think I'm the angry guy? I'll just go be the angry guy. That's fine. I'll just push everybody else away and take it all upon myself because I'm a strong guy, right? Obviously pushing family and friends and things away are not going to serve you in the long run, but I didn't care. And while I'm sitting in the median angry or numb even, uh, I'm angry and I'm just begging a car to go by stolen at 120 miles an hour shooting a gun in the air, right? Because big deal. I'm going to chase it, pit it, might have to shoot them, do the paperwork, go to the house. No big deal. No emotion. Do you understand how backwards that is? That sitting in the media and I'm angry and chasing a bad guy, I have no emotion. Now, there's some tactical reasons for that, obviously, right? We're our most tactically proficient when we're our most emotionally disconnected, right? When I have to go do hard things, I understand that I got to shut that part off. I can't go to calls or deal with a hurt family member, right? Or deal with a friend who just hit a deer on the side of the road. Why would I have been calm in that situation? No emotion. We got this, right? Oh, this horrible thing just happened to this family and now I'm in the middle of it because of my profession. Okay. I actually kind of like that. As morbid as it sounds, I liked being the calm in the chaos. Some of us very well, very well thrive on that, right? And then I'd go home and scream at my kids for not cleaning their room because how dare you not do what I've asked you to do? Because if things aren't done efficiently, somebody's going to get hurt, right? So I could tactically turn that off. So again, this isn't about being nice to people. It's about seeing other people and seeing things in a different perspective. This, whether you call it mindset, whether you call it perspective, whatever resonates with you. But in this group, we have uh, some written documents that tell us about seeing other people. Who, who, somebody bite off Ephesians 4, 29 to 32 for me. Ephesians 4, 29 to 32. We read it yesterday. Man, I hate this one. Ephesians 4, 29 to 32. Anybody read that one for me? 4, 29 to 32. Let no corrupt word come out of your mouth. Oof. But only such as good for the use of building up. So as to impact or put as pleasant to the hearers. And do not grieve the set apart spirit of Elohim by whom you were sealed to the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and displeasure and uproar and slander put away from you along with all evil and be kind towards one another tenderhearted forgiving for one another as Elohim also forgave you in Christ man you're telling me I can't have wrath and anger and bitterness and evil things come out of my mouth you don't understand what he did to me you don't understand what kind of person that guy is you don't understand what a piece of trash he is right <laughs> Are there crappy humans out there? Yep. Right? Um, do we have to treat them uh, with a hug and a smile? <laughs> nope. 
right? I didn't say nice. I said tactical empathy. How is this going to serve you, right? How is it going to serve you getting past that blindness of the fact that you think you're serving anyway and now you're stuck in this loop, right? Getting away from bitterness, wrath. I hate that scripture, man. Like, I'm really good at bitterness and wrath, I'll tell you. Like, I'm pretty good at it, right? But here's a, here's a guy that doesn't hold bitterness and wrath against the stupid stuff that I did yesterday or last week or last year. And we like that, right? That fills us. Man, I'm so glad that I can be loved. I'm so glad that he can forgive and forget, right? Now, I'm going to tell you the first one. I'm not very good at forgive and forget. I'm not to his level. I probably never will be. I think it's probably physically impossible, right? But, man, I sure like that he let his wrath go because I've done some stuff that deserves some wrath, right? I'll be the first to admit, and I'm not supposed to wrath on others. I don't like that very much, right? I don't want to do, do too heavy with this, but somebody get uh, John 15, 9 through 12. You know, since we're supposed to be nice and, and just, just pleasant to each other. John 15, 9 through 12. Man, I hate that one. Love one another as he's loved me. Man, I really like that he forgave me and stuff and, you know, tries to lead me as, as, as a father. But love one another, man, that's a tough one to bite off. Maybe you're a more spiritual giant than I am, right? And again, I've emphasized multiple times, this is a type A group of people. I'm not talking about being passive and nice, right? But here's word, commands, right? Keep my commands. That's one that this group's really big on, right? Keep my commands. <clears throat> Don't have lawlessness. And part of that is love your neighbor. Now, again, love doesn't mean just let them get away with stuff and be nice. We've heard over the last few days about correction and scoffers and, you know, rebuking people. And there's also the one about, you know, the plank in your own eye right? I hate that one too, right? Um, but, but love one another as I've loved you, man, that's, that takes a lot out of me, right? What if loving one another is understanding of seeing other people? Not letting them get away with stuff, not being the victim, not being the martyr. I'm no martyr. Sometimes you have to put your foot down, Sometimes you have to be the enforcer. But what mind says is it coming from? Last one, because I don't want to overload us. Leviticus 19.18. We read that one too. Somebody grab Leviticus 19.18. This is the perfect one for those who were willing to read but didn't want to read long. Do it. You guys should do it in unison. <laughs> What? No vengeance. Man, I'm pretty good at vengeance, I'll tell you. I spent a lot of years thinking that I was, I was kind of the avenger in uniform, right? Now, we do that because of the way that we teach some people to be, right? If, you, if things don't go perfect, somebody will die. Maybe, maybe not. So, let's take this and... Uh, although those words are important, right? No vengeance, wrath, um, love one another, right? But I was just telling brother a few minutes ago, you know, like I still struggle to this day with the really nice robe flowing, perfect hair surrounded by children, Jesus, that just loves me, right? I want him to shake my hand and I go, holy crap, that dude's a blue collar guy right there, right? 
I want him dirty and a little bit pissed off and kind of frustrated, even if it's at me, right? I, we, 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 you know, big box Christianity is, is love. Just, just love them. Just bring them in and love them. That's okay. You need that sometimes, right? I'm not, I'm not knocking that. Maybe that's step one. Make them feel welcome. Make them feel loved. Make them know that there's, right? But at some point, you know, there's some kind of rebuking that goes on when you do it in the right way. But I'm supposed to rebuke them without wrath. So I'm supposed to rebuke them without gossiping either. Man, I hate that one too, right? The, uh, the, the, uh, the, the prayer chain, which is, the, the, which is Christianity for gossip, right? I don't want to talk about, oh, Sister Mary, but oh, I got to tell you what she did so you can pray for her, right? <laughs> so what does this mean? What does this really look like if we're talking about doing these things, all right? Strength isn't just about asserting yourself or maintaining control over others. It's about the ability to understand influence and inspire other people that's your job as a leader whether it's a formal title whether your dad whether your uncle whether your co-worker whether you're the boss your job as a leader is to inspire other people and true empathy allows for deeper connections and a greater ability to motivate and lead effectively how much better do i lead my family and my friends when i understand that they're a person that has hopes and dreams and desires and things they're trying to accomplish and might not understand exactly what I'm trying to say. Let me do a short exercise with you. I want to tell you more about this. And then we'll come back and revisit this. We don't do this out loud. But what I want you to do, and we're going to revisit it in a few minutes when I get done, I want you to reflect on a role that you have right now with somebody that's not going well. A coworker you're pissed off at, a boss who's treating you poorly, a relationship that's not going well, your kids won't listen to you, whatever it is, work, personal. I want you to think of that relationship that you know that you want to see do better, but is not going very well. Reevaluate the conversation, the last conversation we've had with them. What, what is your, in your mind, what is your role in that relationship? Right? We're talking about leaders, we're talking about, but that could be coworker, right? What is your role in that relationship? And did you see them through your challenge-centric view? Right? Did you see them as an obstacle? Did you see them as something in your way? Did you see them in this utilitarian way? Right? Man, I hate talking to this guy, but he'll get me where I'm going. Right? I need something from him, so I'm just going to have to deal with it. Right? Sound, that sounds manly, right? Oh, I'll just put up with this guy because, you know, I need to... I need this to happen, and I'll just suck it up and deal with it, right? But I'll show you, I'm going to show you that it didn't serve you. Did you overlook them? Right? Did you overlook them? No, man, I know they're a human. Yeah. Did you call them an asshole when you got home? Right? Did you act like his or her opinion actually didn't matter and only yours does? Maybe your opinion is correct. Right? Maybe your belief in that conversation, you're 100% correct. But did you treat them like you overlooked them? We're going to come back and visit that conversation here in a minute. So let me tell you a little more about what happens when you actually do this correctly and have these conversations correctly. Listen, empathy is a powerful tool for understanding other people's motivations, their needs, and their concerns. This understanding will actually lead to more effective problem solving conflict resolution, which is what we want, and team dynamics. It's not about surrendering your position. Ugh, I don't surrender. I'm a type A guy. I never surrender, right? It's not about surrendering your position, but about strategically engaging in a way that respects both parties' needs and perspectives. Again, kind of fluffy words. They're both parties' needs and perspectives. But when we revisit this conversation that you just had in your head with somebody in a minute, watch what changes when we add some of this to it. This, this mindset actually does involve some compassion and empathy. Words I'm not very good at, right? But it does not require compliance or passivity. I'm not a passive person. Maybe after I have to take a passive action once in a while, a uh, guy cut me off, whatever, right? That's one I'm not very good at, right? Maybe it is sometimes worth it. 
but I'm not talking about being weak or having compliance or, or being passive. It's about choosing, making a purposeful choice to engage with others in a way that seeks mutual benefit, not, not as you see them getting you where you're going, but mutual benefit and understanding instead of submission and acquiescence to their demands. I don't submit, right? There's about one power in this, in this life that I'll be willing to submit to. And it's nobody's in here and there's no boss, right? Uh, I like you guys, but we don't submit to one another, right? We have compassion for one another. We have empathy for one another. But this isn't about submitting or just giving in to people's demands. That's not love. That's not, that's not taking care of the relationship. What it does include is setting and respecting healthy boundaries. This is a term that we, we love to use in the, in the counseling world, right? Now, the problem is it's been very bastardized by people that just want to use it to make things better in a, in a get-rich-quick scheme or, or overnight. Well, I'm just, you know, just, just set some boundaries with them, right? Boundaries are not, I'm no longer going to let you, let you talk to me this way. Okay, yeah, good luck with that, right? It's about having healthy boundaries. It is possible to understand and empathize with others while still asserting your own needs. I don't want you stepped on. I don't want anybody I talk to or teach to or in my office to be stepped on. But you have to do assert your own needs and boundaries. And that balance of theirs and yours is pretty healthy, productive relationship in my opinion. Again, just listen to some of these things and how they might positively affect and what I mean by this tactical empathy or whatever words stuck with you. And we're going to go back and revisit that conversation in just a minute. What about being a strong leader? I want to be a strong leader. The men in this room are typically strong leaders, whether that means type A to you, whether that means you lead in a certain way, loudly, boisterously, strongly, you know what's going on. You make good, quick decisions. I want that, right? But having an understanding empathy and strategic engagement is what will actually help you lead effectively, resolve your conflicts so you don't just sit there pissed and not doing any good about it, and inspire loyalty, right? I want to follow good leaders. One of the crazy things about public safety being this paramilitary structure, and some of you will have this, right, is rank means something, right? Now, those of you that have served in the military or paramilitary organization will tell you rank doesn't make you a good person, right? But rank does put you in charge, right? And who did you respect more? The people with more stripes on their arm or their bar on their collar, right? No officer jokes, right? Or the, or the bar on their collar, right? Um, or the one that could lead, and it didn't even matter if they had that on them, right? That's who I want to be. That, that's who I looked up to. The ones that could lead effectively, resolve conflicts, and inspire my loyalty to them. I, I don't want people following me just because I said a few good words. Uh, I don't even know if loyalty is the right word. But if people are going to follow, I hope they, they, they understand that I'm trying to come from a place of been there, done that, and messed it up and tried to figure it out instead of, well, it says doctor, so I'm right and you're wrong. Right? That doesn't do me any good. The example, uh, or these examples demonstrate that strength includes emotional intelligence. I like that word, emotional intelligence, and the ability to connect with other people. And then there's some professional excess, success that will come from this, right? Teams and relationships will thrive when individuals feel valued and understood, right? Think about teams that you've been on, people you've been around. Look at this group. You feel understood and valued here, right? We have a lot, some of it's, it, it's by design. We have a lot of the same likes and, and, and things that we're into and ha have talked to each other before, even if we didn't know each other's face, right? It, it's a team and a relationship and that, fr that thrives because lots of us here feel in this room valued and understood, right? Lots of people think like we do. It'll lead to better collaboration, innovation, satisfaction, and then approach fosters this positive environment where everyone, including the leader, by the way, gets benefits out of that, right? Leadership's about guiding and influencing others towards a common goal. This goes for your family, not just your business. And having that tactical empathy will equip you with the tools to do this more effectively, not weakly, 
by building trust, communication, shared vision, right? This isn't about being nice. It's about resilience. One of the most important things that I can teach anybody in the trauma world is this taught you resilience, right? Not, well, aren't you glad that horrible thing happened to you because now you're tougher? I could have skipped the horrible thing, right? And found other ways to feel tougher, right? But what's one thing you always get out of a crappy situation? Resilience, right? If, let, let's take a, a simple example, right? You've hit a deer before, it sucked, you were away from home, you had to figure out what to do with it, you had to figure out how to get home, you're stressed, you had to deal with insurance or fix it yourself, right? Been there, done that. So when the guy's on the side of the road 10 miles from here, and you pull over and like, you all right? Man, I smacked a deer. All right, I know what to do, right? Let's check this, let's call these people, let's, is it worth insurance? I don't know, I've done through, I've been through that, so I can tell you, right? Is this drivable? I don't know a whole lot about trucks. Is this drivable? Well, I don't know. I've been there. We, we can take a look at it, right? I got a flashlight in my truck because I came prepared because I've been through this without a flashlight before, right? It's resilience. What did you learn from that? It's a very small example compared to like major traumas that people have been through. But, uh, you know, uh, some of the best healers are wounded healers. At least Henry Nguyen, I think, that said that. The best healers are wounded healers right? Been there, done that. You, you get what I effectively call borrowed credit, right? If, if I come to you and say, man, I'm going through this thing, or this has happened to me, or I don't even like to talk about it, but this happened to me years ago, and the first words out of your mouth is, dude, I went through something so similar, it's crazy, right? Do I know right then that they know exactly what to do? Nope. But I give them some borrowed credit about what they're about to say might be important, right? It's about resiliency. You, you learn resiliency by going through this. You learn resiliency by going through trauma, and you're going to gain resiliency by figuring out how to have some tactical empathy with your people, being a true leader. Here's another term that I, that I like, leadership valor, right? Those are, bi- those are important words to me, and that's the courage it takes. Oh, this is hard. To step outside one's own perspective, because my perspective is always right, right? To step outside your own perspective and put the needs and challenges of others first. What that demonstrates to me is actual bravery. That's bravery, right? We've done brave things. People in this room have done brave things. You know what's harder than running into uh, a burning building? You know what's harder than... Uh, going in and trying to pull a burglar out of a building that you know he's in there and could be armed. Putting other needs first. That's way harder, right? Some of you are better at it than me. But being willing to look outside my own perspective and put those needs first, that's real bravery, right? I'm not knocking the other bravery. But this is one that I don't accomplish very well. And I look at the people that do, because it goes beyond that physical prowess uh, or that, uh, you know, uh, uh, the just physical toughness and actually highlights emotional strength, which I think is way harder than physical strength. I'm a pretty strong guy. I can tell you how to do that, what to eat, what to take, how to lift. I can tell you how to be strong. That's a, that's, that's a, 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 a strong area for me. But uh, I'm still learning this uh, empathy and uh, seeing other people first. I may, it may not be the strongest area for me. You also gain tactical insight. And again, this is not about, the reason I say these things like this leadership valor and this tactical insight is because when I take these leadership classes, it just feels so fluffy and nice and talk to other people and find out their dreams and desires, right? I get it. I understand what they're trying to say. I also think it's stupid, right? It's not. They know what they're talking about. I'm just a gruff type A jerk sometimes, right? Um, But when I figured out that I will gain this kind of leadership value and I'll gain things like tactical insight, we love tactical insight, right? Tactical insight is what brought half of us uh, to this group. I want to be better at what I'm doing, whether it be uh, my relationship uh, with y'all, whether it be uh, being tactically safe for my family, whether it's about learning things like prepping, whether in some way we're drawn to this group because of tactical insight. I've learned stuff from from everybody here, right? That's understanding and considering the perspectives that others can, others can provide strategic advantages, right? I guarantee that there's people in this room 
that would love to have the influence of a YouTube channel of 200,000 people, right? That, that's, that's a wide berth, right? Now, some of you are smart and think, uh, no, actually. <laughs> that sounds horrible, right? But our type A personality, we like leading, right? We, we like sharing information, right? Um, and, and I want to give tactical insight to people, right? But turns out there's others that can provide some tactical insight. How many times has not just Bear, but people from that channel, people from, from these groups been willing to admit, man, I learned a lot from that guy. I learned a lot from somebody at one of these. I learned a lot from hearing that talk. I learned a lot from talking to somebody at the fire pit, right? Turns out that here it's easy to gain tactical insight because we're all kind of like-minded. What if tactical insight comes from somebody that you think is in your friggin' way, right? Whether it's that personal relationship, professional environment, or leadership challenge, this tactical insight is about making informed decisions. Not nice, informed. Informed decisions that account for the dynamics of human behavior, right? If there was ever a more complicated thing, it's the dynamics of human behavior. Man, some people are weird, right? Now, maybe they think I'm weird, right? But some people, I have no idea how they make decisions, right? I know, or, or the lack thereof sometimes it feels like, right? What about commanding empathy? What if being able to see other people and have this tactical empathy actually creates commanding empathy or, yeah, as a powerful tool for you as a leader? Conveying the idea that true leadership actually commands respect. That rank does not command respect from me. That rank commands the fact that I have to do what you tell me within legal reason, right? And I'm probably going to do it, right? But some of you have been, uh, you know, in the military. And think back to, uh, you know, boot camp or basic days, right? You're, like, you're, you're stuck there. It's not exactly, you're not exactly free to go, right? This drill instructor, this drill sergeant is in charge of you, right? They are in charge. You understand that. And they tell you to do 25 push-ups, can he actually make you do 25 push-ups? <laughs> no. I mean, what's he going to do? Hold you, hold you down and push you up and down on the ground, right? That's not real. Why did you do them? You did them because I respect the position. This is going to get me something I want. I have a goal at the end of this. I respect this person for what they're trying to teach me, even though I want to punch him right now, right? But I do respect what they're trying to do, right? I understand that all this really hard stuff is probably an end goal to it, whether it be earning a title or teaching me something, right? It's, to be, it's debatable, right? But, but they can't make me do it, right? There's going to be consequences if I don't, right? Probably worse. That's what they're trying to teach you. But can they make you do it? There, there's no direct command like that. Why did you do it? Because... Because I have respect of this command, right? If you have respect for your bosses, respect for your coworkers, because of what they do and who they are, they've listened to you, they want your experience, how much better is that relationship? We keep saying things like, you know, command and leadership, and it sounds like work and military. I'm talking about your kids too, man, and your wife, right? Does she have to do what you tell her? Don't even laugh at that because, if, you know. Does she have to do what you tell her to do? No, neither do I. Okay, buddy. You let me know how that works out, right? You, you do it because you respect the relationship, right? Because you're trying to do the right thing. You know, one of you's trying to make a good decision. But I have so much more respect when they have empathy for the challenges that I'm going through, for the thoughts that I have about this, right? How many times have you had a conversation with your spouse? And uh, I, I always like to say that the biggest killer of all relationships is animosity. It's all that crap that you held in that explodes when nobody did the dishes tonight, right? It's not about the stupid dishes. It's about the, the, the animosity you've been holding in, right? And, and how many times have you figured out to have a conversation with that person and that person says, well, this is how that made me feel when you said that. Right? And you thought, hmm, yeah, it turns out I'm a dick. You know? Right? 
I didn't really take into account. I'm not trying to be soft, but I didn't take into account that you saw that differently than I thought, right? And you hug, and maybe you have to go through that conversation again later, right? But I, I have respect for that command system. It's not just authority. Authority is not really going to make me do anything. I'll fight authority, right? But the ability to emphasize and connect with others on this deeper level, guiding teams and families through this insight and understanding. A couple more, and then we're going to go back and visit that conversation. Operational integrity. Oh, we like, I like operational integrity, right? We like to say things about like operational safety, right? We like to use words like integrity. But what if having empathy and being able to see people is not just in my way or where I need to get or that they're forgettable or right offable gives me actually more operational integrity? That alignment between your actions and values, man, that's, that's one we love to say and we don't always do very well, right? Our alignment between our actions and values, acting in ways that are actually consistent with those principles, even when it's challenging, because that demonstrates integrity in my opinion. Right? How many times have we actually taken a little bit of willingness and pride in having to be the bad guy? Well, I'll be the bad guy. I'll tell him. Just in me, I'll tell him. Right? Right? That, that feels like there's some, some toughness there, and sure it is. Right? But what if, but do you always stick your actions and your values together? Bet I can find some people that say you're full of crap. Right? that you say one thing out of this side of your mouth and do something with the other, right? Or you say you're going to go do something. If you were here last year, I talked about keeping your word, right? Keeping your character being the most important thing. What if this tactical empathy you're seeing other people is about actually keeping your word? Because you said you'd protect them and love them forever. Remember through sickness and health and rich and poor. And I know that you were young and dumb and you didn't know what that meant yet because neither did I. But you did give your word. And this isn't an admonishment about relationships. This isn't all the relationships that you have with people. Why should we hire you? Huh. Well, I'm very loyal and, uh, you know, I, I'm, I try to do the right thing with integrity all the time. And then a year later, you're having an argument about your lack of integrity or their lack of integrity. What if this is a compass helping get, get, guide your decisions and actions because now you have a human, an understanding of the other human you're standing in front of or dealing with, right? What if that helps you navigate those relationships and leadership challenges? Because you've got the full picture now. Again, go back to the conversation with your spouse. How many times has she said, well, this is how that made me feel? And I'm not saying she's right or wrong. That's not for me to decide. But it's how it made her feel, right? And you think... Oh, I guess I could have done that a little differently. I didn't realize that you were so upset about that. And we've had those conversations too. But now you've got the whole picture. And then lastly, what if this is kind of a shield of understanding? We like that word shield, right? We use it, pick up the shield, you know, use, use the shield and the armor. What if this is actually going to protect you against a lot of the pitfalls of miscommunication and conflict? How many times, I guarantee you can name hundreds of times in which miscommunication caused you problems, right? Dang, that went wrong. Miscommunicated there, right? How many times have we seen dash cam videos or body cam videos or uh, videos of tragedies happen? And it was all because of a miscommunication. What is the miscommunication? It's lack of the whole picture, right? We're not talking about the telephone game where things get mixed up along the way. But what if the whole communication from your whole team that you bothered to get now because you have some kind of tactical empathy actually gives you the whole picture and you can make a better decision based on this uh, better communication? The understanding that's not only a defensive strategy, which I like the sound of, right? We're all big on defense, you know? We're all big on defense with the ability to do offense, right? We all typically like that. But what if the real defense is not med kits and learning to shoot and having the right stuff at your house, right? Super important. Love all that stuff. Big fan. What if the real defense is preventing the issues before they even escalate? What if that's your anger and not just uh, the bad guy down the street? What if that's fixing your relationship with your family? So now, let's go back, and, and I want you to bring up that conversation that you thought about. 
I'm going to, after that, we're going to talk about one more thing to kind of fix this and we'll, how we'd fix this and we'll wrap up. I want you to go back to that conversation that didn't go well. The boss, the coworker, the family member, somebody here, somebody online, right? Did you see them through that challenge centric view? That they're an obstacle in your way. They're a problem. They're keeping me from where I'm going. Or did you see them in that utilitarian view, right? I talk to them this way because it gets me what I need. And, but, you know, they're a crappy boss, so I can do that anyway. And, you know, they've been crappy to me before, so it's okay that I did it this way. Did you overlook them as a person? Well, let's add some to this. When you did, when you treated them as a challenge or in this utilitarian way of getting you where you're going or you overlooked them, right, as a human, what do you think their view was? What do you think their feelings about that was? I'm not in charge of their feelings, but what do you think their feelings were? What do you think their actual motivations are? If you were to find out that their motivations are different than that conversation, how would that conversation have gone differently? What about their context? I know you know your context, and your context is by God right, right? Because you know, you thought about it, you've dealt with it, you've looked at all the pluses and minuses, you know what you're talking about, your context is right. What's their context? Maybe they're wrong, but maybe you didn't know that, right? What about the missed opportunity of this whole thing? What if in that conversation you'd have figured out how to listen more intently or effectively? Instead of shoving your idea at them because you're by God right and not saying that you're wrong or letting them yell at you or be inappropriate, but what if you were able to listen more effectively? What if you actually stopped and asked some clarifying questions? This is the hardest thing for me to do when I talk to people in my office, right? I, I, uh, I have some very cool opportunities. Just recently, I was at a big institute in New York uh, get, getting this, uh, what we call a fellowship, Re really, really cool thing. It's gonna make my skills even better and better, right? And I knew that they were going to harp on some of the things that, that I did in therapy. I had to turn in recordings. I had to show them actual therapy sessions. And these are people I look up to and I'm willing to take their criticism because it's gonna make me better. But I knew going into this that I am what is considered a very didactic therapist, right? I like to give you all the information, like the last two hours, right? I want to give you all the information so you can take it and go and fix your life, right? That's how my brain works. Because I'm a very tactical person, right? Which is why I like to present this way. Because I lived a life of, all right, gentlemen, at 0, 0400 hours, we're going to this house, we're going in this door, this is our secondary entrance, you're going to go left, you're going to go right, here's the, how far the hospital is, here's our tactical plan, does anybody have any questions or changes, all right, let's go do this, right, I like that, I fed off that, got it, you guys know what you're doing, we're going to go do this, that sounds right, you know, I liked it when they took input, but yep, this is what you need to do, this is what we're probably going to go do it, we've been doing this because we've been doing this for 50 years this way, and we know it's the safest way, this is how we clear a door, this is how we make a traffic stop, right, I like that. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, so I like to just stand up there and give you all the information, even when we're talking one-on-one, -on -one, right? I'm a very didactic person. And the, the number one hindrance or the number one uh, thing I always get from them is, man, you got to let them figure it out a little bit, right? You can't give them all the information, right? Did, I don't ask very good clarifying questions. I don't ask very open-ended questions, right? I'm a very yes and no guy. I, I don't care that you were speeding. I didn't ask why you were speeding. I think it's the stupidest question you ask people. Do you know why I stopped you? Do you know why you stopped me? I think it's the dumbest question cops ask. <laughs> because trust me, I can be doing 115, and if you say, do you know why I stopped you? I'm like, I don't know, man. I don't know, right? I'm not stupid, right? I've never understood that question. Is there any legal, and here's the other one they like to do, is there any legal reason for your speeding? I mean, I got a reason, but probably not legal, right? Is there any valid reason for your, for your traveling at 20 over today? Eh, just sick of driving, I guess. Right, that's a stupid question, right? So I didn't ask those questions. 
I told you what I thought, you know, and then I told you how we're going to deal with it. This is what we're going to do. Does anybody have any questions? You better say no, by the way, because I know what I'm doing by God. I'm the commander here, right? Right? Act, acting effective questions, right? I'm not very good. My, my brain likes to say, many, many of you may do this. My brain likes to say, oh, I, we're 30 seconds in the conversation. I already know what your problem is, right? I see what's going on here, right? Sigmund Freud figured this all out many years ago. He didn't, by the way. He did a lot of cocaine, but... Um, if, if you weren't aware, but, uh, but you know, like, oh man, we, we've known what your problem is for before you even walked in the room. I knew what it was. Now that you give me a couple of clues, I know I need to ask clarifying questions. This is an area I struggle with, right? What if you ask clarifying questions or express some empathy with that person? Again, I want you to take this generally. I want you to think about that conversation with that person. What if you acknowledge your impact on that person? That is a massive step right there. Now, maybe my impact is they need to do their job and I'm going to make them do it, right? But what was your impact on that person? How would you act differently in that conversation with a little tactical empathy? I'm going to give you a personal example here in just a second, but how would you act differently? Understanding that having some tactical empathy leads to all these good leadership qualities and leads to you being able to lead your family better. How would you have acted differently? Would you have understood their needs? Again, how many times you had that, question, that, that conversation where your spouse says, this is how that made me feel, actually. And you think, whew, I'm a dick. I didn't catch that, right? How'd you make them feel? Would you understand their needs? And here's my biggest secret. Can, did, what if you'd have ensured that they were seen? Maybe their idea is stupid and broken and is going to get people hurt, Right? But what if you heard them out first, right? Hey, uh, Commander, I, I, I've been to that house three times for domestics. You know, there's a, there's, a, there's a second door in there that they usually keep locked. No, nope, no, nope, we've done all the surveillance. Nope, right? Right? Or, or the good commander might have said, like, dang, seriously, we didn't see that. All right, let's have a contingency for door number two, right? Maybe we should go in the back. Oh, you, you work that beat and I haven't been in my office in 20 years and you work that beat and you know that they just put wrought iron over the front door and we didn't know that, right? Now, maybe their idea is right. Think that what that would have saved in that silly example. Maybe the idea is wrong, right? Maybe I'd have said something really dangerous, but man, what if I could at least gotten that out and they go, you know what? I think, I don't think that's a good idea, but here's why, right? But they got seen. How, how sick of it do you get when you have an idea and people just shut you off about it, right? It doesn't matter if your idea was good or not or would have saved the whole company or fixed your marriage or made your family feel better. How pissed off are you? How would the outcome have been different? So here's an exercise that, that uh, I did in one of these classes. I'm going to change it a little bit. Uh, but, but there were some areas that we looked at when I had to go through this kind of exercise of thinking of a conversation. And I'm a leader. I wasn't thinking of my family. I was thinking of my business, right? And I, uh, it, was an, it was a former employee. It was an employee that I used to kind of struggle with a little bit, right? Not getting their work done, not doing what they said they do, which just infuriates me, right? That's, I'd rather you call me a jackass than not do what you say you're going to do, right? So, so I wrote down what they did, which is like this this conversation you just had in your own head and then I I wrote down how I perceived that kind of lazy don't have strong integrity they gossip a lot that gets on my nerves I wish they just do their job right that's how I perceive them and then I wrote down what I did about it and I'm a very matter-of-fact tactical technical kind of guy right so I did something about it I wasn't rude I wasn't mean I just did what I had to do right so then we end up trading papers uh, with another CEO in the group, and they don't get to see what that person did or how I feel about it. They only got to see how I responded. And here was the moment. They hand me their paper of the things that they did, and I was to tell them how I felt about that as the employee. I don't have context. I just know how they acted, right? And my first thought when I read what he did was, you're a dick, right? 
And I said, I'd feel micromanaged. I'd feel belittled. I'd feel like uh, maybe I do need to work a little harder in this area, but you don't give a crap anyway, right? So why would I work harder? That was my thought, like, man, this guy's a dick. High multi-billion dollar CEO. And me, that's not, <laughs> looks like that, right? And I'm like, you're a jerk. So then uh, we traded papers back because he had read what I did. It's very matter of fact, taking care of businesses, how things should be done. I'm going to put my foot down and get this handled. And I even, I didn't, I wasn't just mean. I came up with a solution. Step one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, we're going to do to fix this, right? And when I read what he thought about that, I thought, I'm a dick, right? <laughs> she felt micromanaged and she felt like I was just being... One, two, three, four, five, six, right? And the point of this is not that I should have gone to her and said, like, oh, what's going on in your life? You know, it's, can I do the paperwork for you? You know, no, 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 no. We got some efficiency problems here. We got some problems we need to fix, right? But I want the boss back in the day to come in and say, uh, you're jacking this up. Put a plan together to fix it. I'll help you if you need a plan. Get it done by next Friday. Roger, got it. Got it. My bad. I feel like a dick. My bad. I didn't get it done. Said I would, right? That's not how everybody operates. So when I said, here's one, two, three, four, five, six, you're going to do it by next Friday, that person felt very micromanaged, right? Put down, not heard. Again, not about me going in and saying, you know, gosh, what's going on with you? I'll give you three more weeks if you need it. You know, that might not be reality. Three weeks may be too late, right? But what if she'd have just been heard at least? Hey, I'm having a lot of trouble navigating how to get this part done. Oh, shit, I know how to do that part. I can help you with that part. And next thing I knew, everything was done, right? Like, she did it over the weekend. It was awesome, right? But I thought he was a jerk, and he thought I was a jerk. Not about fake happiness, right? Let me start to wrap up with this, because I like to leave you with an action plan. Now, this is a much longer conversation that I think... Uh, has to happen with people. I'm just going to give you a couple of bullet points and tidbits to take with you. What I practice is a type of therapy called rational motive behavior therapy. I do rational motive behavior therapy because rational motive behavior therapy changed my life, right? There's some other things that helped me along the way, some other acronyms and other things that I had to learn, but it changed my philosophy. And with rational therapy, what we know is that it's not the event that matters the most. Events, things that happen to you, around you, things you've done, things you perceive, do not cause an emotion. An event filtered through your belief system causes the emotion. Now, we think that's wrong when, we, when we're coming up, right? No, 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 no. Thing happens, have an emotion about it. You steal from me, I'm mad. You break up with me, I'm sad, right? Something bad happens, I feel angry, right? No, because if a hundred people in the room perceive the same thing that you just did, watch the same thing, went to the same thing you just did, how is it possible that they may have a different emotion about that? We're not robots. We're not trying to say make bad things good, right? But the reality is that it's not the events that themselves that disturb us, but the beliefs that we hold about what that event meant will actually cause our emotion. We're usually our own worst enemy about this right? hundred percent of the time because of what we call irrational beliefs, these things that you can't prove. So if you stub your toe, it's not the stubbing of the toe while a silly example that makes you uh, mad, right? It hurt, right? I don't know if any of you, I don't know if the same beds are the same ones in my room, but they got these big like metal corners on them that stick out. Dude, three times I've hit my freaking toe on this stupid thing, you know, and like, 10 years ago, I'd have flipped the bed over, to be honest with you. I'm not proud about that, but whatever, right? You know, and it hurt. It still hurt, man. The one yesterday really hurt because it was already bruised, right? But it's not that that made me mad. It's the belief that the universe conspired to put that freaking bed in my way. What kind of dumbass builds a bed with the legs that are wider than the bed, right? You should put a sign out about this. Why would you put this so damn close to the air conditioning that you know everybody who walks by here is going to stub their toe? I freaking hate this freaking place. One star. Right? <laughs> right? Nobody conspired to put that stupid bed there, you clumsy dumbass. Got a, got a raise for that. Guarantee the engineer got a raise. And he's laughing his ass off 
with his money right now, right? Here's what happens. And this, this is a short coverage of a long conversation, but I just want you to take this with you. It is your irrational demands that you put in the middle. Is it really rational that the world conspired against me to put that stupid bed there? No. It's rational that I keep stubbing my toe on the stupid bed, right? And I feel like a dummy for it, right? But dummy's not the problem. My anger at this stupid ass bed and all the people that conspired to put it here has left me angry flipping the thing over. I didn't, just whoever's watching that works here, right? I didn't, right? And irrational doesn't mean stupid or dumb or made up. We're rational people, right? We love tactics. We love safety. We love leadership. We love the word, right? I want to know and I believe that I understand these things correctly because I'm rational about it. I have evidence that points towards this, right? When to put a tourniquet on? How long can you leave it on? What should you carry with you? What kind of bullet fires best? I train on this. I practice this. What should you keep in your car? What do you understand of the word, right? I, I, I like that stuff. I like concrete tactics. Irrational means not based on evidence. And I lived in a world, maybe some of you are like this. I, I worked in a world that evidence meant everything. I've never gone to court and sat on the stand and, and said, I'm, I'm pretty sure he did it right? I went on the stand and said, I know he did it. Let me show you the seven pieces of evidence that tell me. I got video. I got witnesses. I saw it myself. I've eliminated all other suspects. His fingerprints are on the scene. He did it, right? Now, what the jacked up criminal system does with that is not my, you know, control, right? So we make decisions based on rationality, right? If somebody comes to you and says, what's with this Torah stuff? This seems really dumb. Why don't you eat pork? You can say like, well, let me show you the things that have led me to this decision, right? But man, you'll irrational the crap out of your stupid emotions, right? It's not the events, it's the shoulds. It's these things that you demand, these irrational demands, these shoulds, these shalls, these must nots, these have tos, these cannots, the should nots. They must not give him the promotion. They must give it to me. How'd that work out for you, right? And it doesn't mean you didn't want the promotion or that it wasn't bullshit that the other guy got the promotion, right? Maybe it was. Maybe you are the better man for the job, right? But what does your mindset do now? Angry, pissed, livid. I hate this freaking job. Can't stand it here. Those guys forgot where they came from. They don't listen to me anyway. I should have gotten the promotion. There's a big difference between a rational belief. Hey, I think it's a bunch of bullshit. I'm not really sure I want to work here anymore. And I'm pretty pissed. Yeah, go be pissed. That's fine. Go be pissed. Oh, you're pissed? Poor you, right? What's the problem? They should have given me that damn promotion. They can't give it to that other guy. It must not be like this. Why is the world always so unfair to me and I'm angry? Guess what your decision is now? Angry. How'd that work out for you? Not good. So you have to be willing to identify these stupid demands that you have. They can't do this. That deer should not have been in the road. I got video that says it was, right? I don't want the deer in the road. I'm kind of upset that my dream truck got smashed up a little bit. It's metal. We'll live. It's fine, right? But why would I have ripped the bumper off 10 years ago? The world should not be like this. This isn't fair. I'm going down to do this free talk. I'm probably going to lose money on the deal. Uh, and I'll say as a side note, I gain more than I would ever give here. So, you know, please understand that, right? But... But this is where my mindset would go, right? Oh, I'm not fucking losing money and my truck's broken and I can't do this. This is stupid. They're probably not going to listen anyway. I don't even have a speech ready. It's probably going to be crap when I get there. Dude, you hit a deer. Calm down, right? It shouldn't be this way. It's a bunch of bullshit. I'm leaving. I'm out, right? And I'm going to take seven people with me, actually. You know what? I'm gonna, y'all need to just come with me. This is all a bunch of bull crap, all the stuff we've been studying for years, right? <laughs> we've all done it, right? We've recruited other people onto our side because we're angry. Maybe your belief is right, but if you're angry or anxious or depressed or guilty, I'm going to tell you it's wrong, right? And it's not the thing that's getting you there. There are people in this room that are depressed, right? There are people in this room that are guilty. There are people in this room that are angry, that are anxious. Never a good place to be. And maybe we hide it well. Maybe we've been willing to have a conversation with our brother about it. But guess what got you there? Not the events. I know you got hard things going on if you feel depressed or angry or anxious or guilty. But you're going to have to learn eventually it's not the event that got you there. The, uh, the event absolutely impacts us. 
Doc, are you saying we shouldn't be sad about 9-11? I'm pretty sad about 9-11. I've been there, right? There's a big, big difference between sad and despair. And what gets me to despair? I can't believe that happened. That cannot happen. It shall never happen again. It must not happen. I can't handle this. It's the most awful thing that could possibly happen in my life. And I'm weaker because of it. Which part of that was true? I don't want it to happen. It's a horrible tragedy. I know you've had things that have happened in your life. I picked a big event. I know you've had things happen in your life that impact you. But it's your demand that it should not have happened, shall not have happened, must not be this way. You label yourself as a piece of crap for it. It's the worst possible thing that could possibly happen to your life, and I cannot possibly handle this. That sounds like depression and anxiety to me. And we're not trying to change that too irrationally. Well, you know, I'll just take it all in stride. No big deal. I can handle this. You know what? I love adversity, right? Weirdo. Uh, yes, it's going to make you resilient. Yes, it's going to make you stronger. But the rationality to that is, man, I... I feel down and I wish this hadn't happened. I wish I hadn't hit that deer. But is it the worst thing that could happen in my life? Bet not. Can you handle it? Bet you will. You are right now. Handle it doesn't mean it went well. Handle it means you handled it. Right? I got plenty of things in my life. You got plenty of things in your life that you look back and think, I'd have done that differently, but we got through it. I wish it hadn't happened. Right? It's your irrational demand that it should not, shall not, must not, cannot be this way. I label myself as crazy or weak or stupid or somebody else as a piece of crap. I say it's the worst thing that could possibly happen and I can't handle this that's leading to your horrible emotion. So you have to acknowledge that maybe some of the stuff you say isn't evidentially correct. Be willing to challenge that, not fake happy. Not fake happy. Be willing to accept that acknowledge that it's your belief that's got you in trouble because we have to dispute the hell out of them and replace them with some alternatives. I prefer to succeed, but it's not a catastrophe if I don't. I hate that I did that, but I'm not a piece of shit because I did it. You can't do that to me. I don't want you to do that to me. And because you did, I'm not going to trust you anymore. Okay. That all sounds very valid to me. Life isn't always fair, but I guess I'll handle it if it's not. Sometimes you hit a deer on the side of the road. I know that's a very small anecdotal thing to some of the things you, that have happened in your life, right? Adopting this mindset, I'm gonna close with this. Adopting this mindset, it's not about becoming passive or weak. In fact, it, in my opinion, it's the opposite. And it took me a long time to understand that. It's not passive and weak. It's about becoming mentally tough, becoming resilient, and in control of your own emotional state because you're ruining everything with it. It's about saying, I'm in charge of how I feel, and I refuse to let these irrational beliefs run the show because those irrational beliefs affect me negatively in my emotion and will make me see other people as in my way, as something that gets me to where I'm going, or irrelevant. Write them off. So the empathy gets you looking in the right direction. And the rational thinking gives you the tools to clear the path on the way. That's a one-two punch, man. Takes charge of your life. It lets you lead effectively. And it lets you live more rationally, which is not happy. It's just the most properly emotional way that you and the people around you can be. Right? That's all I got.